So great to be here and great to see you. Um, so today, um, I want to just run through, um, you know, sort of a general overview of what um, one might say 20th century continental philosophy um, can contribute to a philosophy of art and, and reflection on aesthetic experience in general. And I think one of the underlying things I'm trying to bring out is that aesthetic experience, we often think about aesthetic experience, the experience of beauty or a particular artwork as a subset of other types of experience. And I think one of the things that occurs in 20th century European philosophy is that it becomes more paradigmatic, that is reflective of human experience in general. So when we're thinking about art, we're actually thinking about all experience in a particular way. Um, and so it, it takes on a much larger role, I think, in 20th century philosophy, uh, in your 20th century uh, European uh, philosophy. So this is, is why, uh, as a phenomenologist, someone who works on um, uh, Husserl, Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, as I'll show, uh, my, my work has not been primarily on the philosophy of art, and yet it almost always is. Um, at various crucial times in the texts of these philosophers that I work on, um, art appears um, either explicitly or implicitly, or at least meaning as some type of experience that is a feeling experience and not just a cognitive experience uh, occurs as um, a, a kind of central component. So I'm going to try and work through that a little bit um, today and, and hopefully um, have some discussion with you about this approach. Um, and I, I certainly know that, um, you know, you could, you can interrupt and ask questions, but also, uh, I noticed I failed to give my uh, 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 email address, but I'll make sure uh, you get it somehow so that if there are remaining questions, which there will be because there always are, um, uh, we, can, we can stay in contact uh, somehow. So as I uh, say uh, in this first slide here, I know this, uh, um, we're really thinking about um, maybe particular concepts in the phenomenological tradition that can be useful for thinking about, you know, contemporary trends in art and design. But I'm also, again, thinking about more than just, you know, artistic production and uh, design production. I have a, a, a larger sense of, you know, experience in general as being artistic. Uh -huh. And this is something that goes back in the continental tradition in various thinkers. But uh, if, if we call to mind someone like Friedrich Nietzsche, you know, he, he basically has this idea of, of philosophy as art and, and life as art. Uh, so um, thinking about the authentic existence of a person or a community in aesthetic terms. So it's a much broader conception of uh, uh, artistic ex experience. And I just like to conclude with a little bit about trying to amplify some of this, the aspects we're going to touch upon uh, in the talk by referring to a kind of aesthetic of desire. Um, so this is borrowing a bit more from the psychoanalytic tradition and uh, the work of Jacques Lacan, um, who uh, has written a lot about desire and symbolic order within which desire gets constituted. So how and why do we desire what we desire? And this can be quite illuminate, illuminating, I think, for uh, reflection upon aesthetic uh, experience. Okay, so uh, just to introduce you to some of the persons, uh, I think you may have uh, heard or Maybe even, has anyone read any Husserl, Heidegger, or Merleau-Ponty uh, in, in the room? So, 
oh well i see we need that we have the need for a philosophy course uh you know in uh, to mix into the curriculum so these are three major figures in uh 20th century um european philosophy uh husserl being the earliest and sometimes thought about as the father of phenomenology uh his successor in Freiburg was Martin Heidegger, um, and his text, Being in Time, from 1927, is perhaps one of the most seminal texts in 20, contemporary uh, philosophy, explicitly or implicitly. So almost everyone, even doing um, a, you know, explicit philosophy of art, has read Heidegger. Uh, and Being in Time is an early work, a somewhat later work, which is obviously more directly related, is the origin of the work of art. Uh, so this is a very complicated text from the later Heidegger, where he really is, is trying to address what it means to have um, an experience, a lived experience of uh, meaning that is constituted or can be described as aesthetic meaning. Um, and then Merleau-Ponty, Merleau-Ponty is very important. He, he follows in the um, phenomenological tradition. He read a lot of Husserl, he read a lot of Heidegger, um, and he merges them in a very interesting way. And one of the things that is most important about Merleau-Ponty is that he focuses on a phenomenology of the body. So as you know, you know, philosophers tend to be rather abstract and it's almost as though you know there's there's the world of ideas as plato would call it and and that's where we live but of course we live in embodied existence and this has been one of the stumbling blocks for um, a philosophy of art because i think we always have a more cognitive or um idea oriented sense of art, rather this, this embodied sense of uh, aesthetic experience. And Merleau-Ponty is very important for taking actually a notion of body that's there in Husserl, but not very clear, um, and working with some of Heidegger's notions um, to, to put the body as the site of experience. So not the mind, but the body. And it's not as though the body, uh, you know, is just the physical body. That's the important distinction in phenomenology. It's somehow the lived body. And I'll refer to some bodily experiences today as a way of trying to, to get at a phenomenology of aesthetics. Um, so those are some of the people I'll be referring to and some of the texts. And here are maybe some of the principles we can think about. So um, the first two thinkers are German, and they have this, this sort of interesting motto, zu den Sachen selbst, to the things themselves. So when I teach phenomenology uh, to undergraduates, I always make them um, you know, memorize this um, so that it becomes the motto of the class, zu den Sachen selbst. And, um, it's um, it's quite funny in Husserl's time, the students actually wrote. Speaking of art, they wrote a a song called the phenomenological song, uh, which has the chorus "Zu den Sachen selbst, Zu den Sachen selbst." So this is how you know phenomenologists, uh, phenomenology students in Husserl's day, um, spent their time um, playing with some of these notions in an, in an artistic and creative way. So to the things themselves. And in that motto, I think you sense something that in, in some ways, the things themselves are not so easily apparent or explicit as we think they are. In other words, how is it that we experience things, all sorts of things? objects, other subjects, artworks, subways, schools, institutions, um, all of these things, 
you might think are rather apparently given to us. But when we start to conduct some sort of phenomenological analysis, we realize that the complexities at work in any human experience is usually unarticulated, you know, or very implicit. Um, and so this is one of the sort of notions that's at work in phenomenology is that we're, we're we have to access that which is hidden. It may be hidden by proximity. We may be so embedded in our practices that we don't see the conditions which constitute those practices. And so phenomenology is about accessing this sort of hidden structures that are that are at work in everyday existence. So not putting particular emphasis on philosophy or cognitive practices or intellectual practices, but all practices. And again, this is where I think um, art and aesthetic experience um, starts to play a central role in, in phenomenology. So a technical term that occurs in the phenomenological tradition for this getting back to the things themselves is phenomenological reduction. So this is just something you'll come up, you know, if you if you do a, a a web search for phenomenology, you're going to find something about phenomenological reduction uh, somehow. And this idea can, I think, generally be uh, explicated by saying somehow we have to break our, um, and these are words from Husserl, blind or naive or forgetful immersion in everyday life, precisely in order to see the things themselves of everyday life. So something has to break. Uh, Husserl sometimes says our bondage to the world in order to see the world, you know, and how it's given to us. Because in our everyday existence, and in our busyness, we don't see how meaning gets constituted. Of course, things are very meaningful. And, and one of the things that I think it's important to say about phenomenology from the beginning is, it's not a very skeptical philosophy. It's actually quite the opposite. There's such an abundance of meaning in the world in which we're already embedded that we just don't see it. And so the meaning is sort of operating again at this subterranean or implicit uh, level. Um, so, you know, you, one can think of any sort of social practice. Um, taking, taking the subway, uh, subway, you know, so North American expression, uh, you know, the pu public transit. Um, we don't really think about it when we do it. We just know we got to get somewhere. But of course, any public transportation system is incredibly complex. You know? And we don't even think about, you know, who designed it, why they have the stops here. Um, it just functions. And that function is meaningful. That is, we have an experience of meaning just getting on public transit. Uh, but that meaning is very implicit. Uh, so the meaning of, we, we just use it a, a, you know, as a use function or we have a utilitarian gr grasp of things that are meaningful. But we don't actually notice the complexity of the world in which we live. Um, and so phenomenology s suggests that we have to, you know, bring out some of this um, implicit structuring that is always already going on, right? And one of the reasons phenomenology stands in sort of a critical position vis-a-vis -vis the history of philosophy is that that always already um, going on, that already implicit functioning, when it is made explicit in philosophical discourse, 
it often misses the lived experience of the everyday. So phenomenology is on this tightrope. It wants to analyze our everyday experience and the structure of how meaning comes about in our everyday life. And at the same time, avoid some of the um, misappropriations or misexplications, so faulty explications of that everyday meaning that happen in the history of philosophy. And we'll see that in particular with regard to art. Right. So somehow our, our way of approaching art is going to miss something about the lived experience of art. And it's the same when we think about phenomenological reduction. We want to access our everyday experience and at the same time not lose it through hyper-abstract constructions as though that gives the meaning of the everyday experience. The everyday experience is already meaningful. Um, for from not for phenomenologists. So again, you don't have to do a lot of construction, a mental construction. Um, and again, this is part of the problem with philosophers is they tend to do that. And in doing that, they tend to lose sight of, of the everyday. Um, now, when we think of this kind of methodology of phenomenological reduction, which obviously is a bit of a balancing act, as, as I uh, say, um, one of the things that's worthwhile noting as we begin is that for Husserl, um, this is a more voluntaristic or active um, um, moment or goal. In other words, we can kind of train ourselves to be phenomenologically acute, where you start being interested in more and more aspects of, of the everyday. You, you notice things that perhaps you had crossed so many times before, um, but through kind of a sharpening of phenomenological focus, you become more attentive to, to the everyday. So this becomes sort of a methodology, uh, a, a kind of worked upon methodology. Um, it's not a strict logical methodology. It's much more like developing a skill, I think, in, in Husserl. But nonetheless, it is something you can work on. Uh, so you develop a kind of phenomenological sensitivity to the everyday uh, and its richness. For Heidegger, and this is just something to, to you know, keep in mind, in, in my reading of these thinkers, he's a much more what one might call kind of emphasizes the passive element of phenomenological reduction. Um, that is, and I, I like this word, breakdown. So sometimes our average everyday experience is frustrating too. So it works smoothly. You get on the public transit and you get to where you're going. Great. You never think about it. It just works. But when it breaks, suddenly its importance and its meaning for you becomes clear. Where's the train? It's late. And, uh, you know, this is particularly true when you have a very good public transit system like Hong Kong. Everything's always late in Montreal. But, you know, here, I know people get very frustrated on the, on the platform. You can feel it, you know. And, and so on. But so somehow that mere functioning of the everyday becomes more apparent to you because it's not working. And, you know, sometimes that can be just, you know, immediately fixed and then we kind of forget about it. But at other times, um, you know, it, it creates a, a kind of um, sensitivity to maybe the complexities of things. Uh, and so breakdown can in fact um, be a moment where something about the constitution of meaning in everyday life shows itself. And we don't have to ask for breakdown. <laughs> it happens. So in, in, in Heidegger, there's this 
stronger emphasis on the way in which the loss of meaning that happens in everyday life is somehow a clue towards being more attentive to the meaning of everyday life and actually is constitutive of the meaning of uh, everyday life. So I think um, uh, we, we spoke about the mass earlier on. Um, you know, so this has been a tremendously hard period for everybody. And part of our everyday experience, our normal everyday experience of being with people is, of course, that we see them. We see a face. You know? and, and we see a body. So, you know, all this long, this uh, Zoom education, um, you know, that we all had to be part of. I mean, I know people have different views on it. <laughs> Very hard to teach a large philosophy class on Zoom. Um, it just really doesn't work. Um, and which is interesting because you think, oh, it's so abstract. You just put the ideas up on the board and, and so on. It should work. But uh, again, thinking itself is a bodily experience and an embodied experience with others. And that has a, an element of the face-to-face, -face, um, which is also a principle which becomes very important in a 20th century European um, uh, philosophy. So we've had this breakdown of a particular way in which we normally comport ourselves to each other. And I think everyone kind of experiences that as painful. But there's also a return where you actually then recognize how valuable it is to be with others, you know, to see others, to see a smile, to see a reaction. And then and, and that constitutes a good part of our being with others in our average everyday life. So it's a it's a good example of kind of a forced phenomenological reduction. I think people should be more attentive now to the value of the face of the other um, in our uh, average everyday engagements, um, uh, so on. Um, and one of the things that I could just say while I'm mentioning these general principles for both Husserl and Heidegger, at various points when they're thinking about phenomenological reduction, they actually do specifically mention art. So and the one way in which art enters into the discourse of phenomenology is as a way of phenomenological reduction. So in a letter to Hugo von Hofmannsthal of, I think, around 1909, Husserl says, you know, the artist and the phenomenologist share this interest in phenomenological reduction. Um, so, you know, opera, any type of artwork. Von Hofmannsthal, of course, wrote a lot of the um, libretto for um, Strauss's um, operas um, and other, you know, po poetry and novels. Um, so those become ways in which we access the everyday through stepping back a little bit through a, a particular lens. And again, this is where artistic creativity plays such an important role as a, as a sort of form of phenomenological reduction. Um, Heidegger also picks this up very early on in Being in Time already. So poetry, he says, discloses. Now, eventually in his later work, Heidegger develops a very broad sense of poetry. <laughs> and, and the most poetic poetry is architecture for Heidegger. So it's the one that most um, um, says something about our world, makes something explicit, and makes explicit the limits of our world at the same time. So he has this famous example of the Greek temple in the origin of the work of art. That's art, the Greek temple. Um, so um, in Being in Time, it's not really clear what he means by poetry. It's in the section on discourse. And so it, we actually tend to think about real poetry. But what does, what you know, like actual poesy. But 
what does poetry do? It reconfigures language. And in a certain sense, from a grammatical standpoint, it often makes no sense at all. And yet it's meaningful. It's meaningful. It draws attention to language, which again, we use in the average every day, just like we take the public transit. We use it, you know? And it's only when we bump up against its limits and it breaks when we can't give voice to our meanings. Or maybe a more everyday example, right now, I know I'm speaking in most people's second or third language. So you're always phenomenologically justified to say, I don't understand what you just said. Um, but running up against an, a foreign language is a really interesting experience. Um, you know there's meaning operating there, and I hope you're getting some of the meaning of what I'm saying in English, but it, it also breaks, you know, and that break can just be, again, the everyday experience of the different ways in which people speak, you know. Um, isn't it interesting how we say that in everyday discourse? I, I don't get what you mean. Grammatically, it's probably very clear what the person said. But in terms of meaning, you know, something, something's happening in language. And that's when language calls attention to itself. It calls attention to itself when we're lecturing, uh, you know, as teachers, because we're trying to express something in a way that's meaningful to you. But, you know, maybe my language is failing. I can't, I'm not finding the right words for you. Um, and therefore, there's a kind of loss of meaning in what sounds very meaningful to me, you know, um, but maybe not to you. And so then in dialogue about language, we can uncover, you know, a deeper sense of meaning. But in average, everyday discourse in our mother tongue, we just use it. You know, you don't have to think about every word. What is this? What word attaches to this table? You know, I have to do some sort of big mental construct. No, it's the table. That's a computer. That's a chair. I didn't have to do any thinking at all. No. And, and language works with such facility. We sometimes overlook how marvelous it is. And poetry calls attention to the magnificent nature of language as a meaning, a space of meaning um, somehow. So again, that's something we can say about art. Okay. So let's, um, oh, this, you know, I, unfortunately I am a philosopher, so I tend just to give lectures and go on and on and on. So I try and provide pictures every now and then. That's one thing I learned through COVID and teaching on Zoom is you need more pictures. Um, so this is uh, Husserl uh, on the left and Heidegger on the right. And I kind of like this picture because they didn't get along all that well, personally. Um, so it's kind of Heidegger's rather combative, you know, and he's the younger philosopher and Husserl's kind of, you know, I don't know what to make of this young student uh, who's so aggressive uh, and so on. So, um, there's our, there's my design side coming out, a photo. Okay, so to the core of the talk, um, we, we wanted to talk about some standard views in the philosophy of art about aesthetic experience. And one of the things I'm claiming, and so again, this is very generally, obviously a lot of these views are much more complex than I'm making them here. But um, I, I would say, you know, we can, we can characterize characterize, maybe caricaturize a little bit too much. I, I admit that. Um, the way in which the history of philosophy has treated aesthetic experience. And I suggest that, you know, we can kind of divide this into two poles, two extremes, you know. On the one hand, there's the objective side. Here, there is an artwork, which is a special sort of thing, which sets it apart from other types of things, it has particular properties. You know, the properties that belong to an artwork, 
Um, often we, we, we might make them very general beauty, uh, something like this. And even everyday objects, then we can say, oh, that object is almost an artwork. And this is where design gets very interesting is, you know, where you say, oh, that's a beautiful chair, you know, but you don't think it should go in the museum. So the, the, these, the, these categories we use often, you know, are, are themselves not sharp and kind of fuzzy. But when we say that, we have in the back of our mind, there's some sort of objective set of qualities that an artwork has, and maybe everyday objects share them to some, and maybe not, you know? A painting clearly is an artwork of some sort. Now, again, we can talk about all sorts of different theories of painting uh, in the background, but what I'm trying to emphasize is that often in our everyday discourse, we have this sense an artwork is a particular type of object and it can be accounted for by its objective characteristics. Um, so it has these certain properties or it's the objective expression of an artist's creative project, right? So the artist has an idea and it gets objectively expressed in this thing called, you know, an artwork. Um, on the other pole, on the other side, we have this, uh, you know, so-called subjective side. Um, it is claimed that every work of art is experienced differently, right? Depending on a variety of contextual factors ranging from individual taste to cultural context. So again, it doesn't sound crazy on the outset. We use this a lot. We, we experience this a lot. You go to another culture, you find certain things, and you just don't find them aesthetically pleasing because you grew up with a different aesthetic. I mean, you can even think about food in this way. And certain types of food just don't appeal to, to other people. Now, as a very advanced phenomenologist trying to be open to the complexity of everyday life, I love every type of food. Uh, so, you know, I'm always willing to try. But as you know, some people are very picky. So I just don't like this. In other words, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't do it for me. Um, and so we kind, of, we kind of think then that taste or aesthetic experience, a positive experience of meaning is somehow subjectively constructed. So not, not the objective properties of the food, you know, but the subjective experience of those objective properties, right? So that becomes, these are kind of the two poles. Now, quickly, um, oh, sorry, there we go. Um, quickly to move on to how phenomenology might work. Back up. Sorry about that. Should go back. Okay. Can I go back one? And then we come in here. That was going to be So I'm gonna go back one slide. Come along with me. So I'll just go back. There we go. Set up the wonderful artistic intervention. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry, now I'm going too far. Okay, so let's critique these two objective and subjective oriented understandings of art. Um, but very generally, I say. These standard views suggest that the experience of work of art is best understood from either of these two poles. Right? But let's take a look at the problems with these views. And again, it's not as though philosophers are very familiar with these problems and trying to address them. I think they still remain stumbling blocks if you start with 
doesn't mean that there might not be objective or subjective elements, but how we account for them philosophically is much more complicated than it is often the case in the history of philosophy, and certainly in the So, you know, what's the critique of the objective view? Um, the, the critique of the uh, objective view is, oops, just one more. Back one more. There we go. Um, is quite obviously people disagree. <laughs> you know. So again, I gave the example of food. Um, uh, people disagree on the aesthetic experience or the meaning of a particular artwork. So everyone has this experience. And I often give my students advice, be very careful who you go to a museum with, you know? Very dangerous to go on a first or second date to a museum because of course you find you have these deep disagreements. You know, so look at this beautiful painting. It's kind of, you know, I don't like it at all. No, 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 no. You know, don't you see it? No. No. So this is just a very standard experience. And more you articulate objective qualities, the less the person likes it, you know. Then you start to become overbearing, you know. It's like, you've got to see it, you know. And then the person starts to think, I don't really like this person very much because, you know, they, they, they want me to see the thing that they see, but I don't see what they see. So this is a very standard everyday experience. And yet so, somehow philosophers have frequently just tried to overcome this and say, you know, well, we'll just account for all these variations somehow with, you know, there's got to be some basic objective qualities there. And I think that's actually just going the wrong way about how to describe aesthetic to begin with that objectivism, even if it's, even if it's a very attenuated objectivism as it turns out to be. Uh, secondly, the interesting thing about you know, artistic experience and, or aesthetic experience is not only do we disagree with other people, we disagree with ourselves. <laughs> so how often have you had this experience? You love a song. It's a new song. It's the hottest song. You don't even care whether your friends like it or not. You like it. And you're plugged into it everywhere you go. Just makes me feel good. And it makes you feel good. And it makes you feel good. And then one day you wake up and you go, that song is really boring. It's, it's, it's as though its meaning has evaporated overnight. And I no longer like it. And maybe, you know, later on, two or three years later, you hear the song and you go, I don't know why I ever liked it. Not only is it not meaningful, it's awful. You know? So everyone has this experience. So aesthetic experience doesn't have, you know, this kind of objective certainty or guarantee about it, even within myself. So I'm, I can't be the objective guarantor of the meaning of a particular experience. So this, again, leads us away from some sort of objectivistic account. Um, and again, I think it's extremely interesting how no amount of objective facts will necessarily convince anyone to have a aesthetic experience of a particular thing. You must like this book. Isn't it beautiful? And of course, this is what kills education for many people, is that, you know, pedantic teachers insist you must like this piece of art. You must like this piece of classical literature, whether it's Chinese literature, or, you know, whatever tradition you're in, you know, it's the most important thing ever written. You're like, well, no. You know, and it's not just because you're a lazy student or, you know, perhaps you're very well attuned to things. It just doesn't objectively exercise the pull the teacher claims uh, it does. 
And again, in theories of art and art production, a lot of emphasis is then placed on provenance of a work of art. So how it came about, you know, so, okay, maybe you don't get it now, but if I tell you more about, you know, the, the, the period, if I tell you more about the artist, if I do a kind of quasi psychoanalysis of the artist and say, oh, but you know, this, this, you can only understand this piece of art because Shakespeare really had a bad time with his parents. And if you understand why Shakespeare or that Shakespeare had a bad time with his parents, then you'll really understand King Lear better. You know, these are the types of kind of providential accounts that people give, but don't necessarily make you like King Lear any better or worse. You know? So they, they, these, these sorts of fluctuating types of experiences um, uh, suggest that we can't really tie all of this to some sort of objective um, certainty. Okay, now for me to have a drink of water and for an aesthetic interlude, this is a song that I just came back to in, I liked when the movie came out in the 1990s. I forgot about it. And just recently, maybe it was in, a, in anticipation of returning to Hong Kong, I went back and was listening to this song and then watched a whole bunch of these movies uh, by a director who you will certainly uh, know. So this is our musical interlude. Uh, yeah, there might, I might have uh, inadvertently attached some, some propaganda. I am not being supported by the Nonio uh,
常言道，冇关系。喂，所以我我 entitled this， so of course you all know this is from， I guess an English Chunking Express， uh， the Wan Kar Wai and uh, uh， very popular film， and it's an interesting um choice of music from a global aesthetic experience. So that's an original song by the Cranberries. So, and um, kind of introduce this sort of dream pop of the 1990s into Asia. Uh, so it it was really a, a seminal um, artistic moment um, in a way. But of course, one of the things I was I was just thinking is maybe it'll be interesting to a Hong Kong audience. Maybe boring. You know, maybe it just shows Professor Buckley's very old-fashioned, likes movies from the 1990s, you know, and earlier. Um, who knows? Who knows? So, does that mean then that aesthetic experience and the meaningful experience of this song is merely subjective? Well, one of the things that phenomenology does, even though it's about experience happening to a subject. You don't want to just objectify subjective experience,、um, and you don't want to simplify away from many factors of subjective aesthetic experience、um, that are more than just subjective. You know, so to try and mirror what I said about some of the flaws in the objectivist view,、um, the same thing happens with the subjectivist view. So it's not just that people disagree; people agree. And people agree deeply, and by agree, I don't mean just have cognitive agreement. When you go to a movie, so maybe maybe this is a more successful date, you know, and and you go to a movie, and and both you and and the person you're with are crying together about the movie. That's a common experience. It's not merely subjective. Somehow you could feel together something.、Um, so when we think of of art as being a merely subjective experience, I think we miss something also about sort of the co-constitutive or social possibilities of、um, art.、Um, similarly, I even agree with myself from time to time. So even though I may Sometimes like a song and sometimes dislike a song, 
there's some sort of continuity over time to my aesthetic orientation. Otherwise, I wouldn't be me. Now, it doesn't mean I'm not shocked from time to time that I really like something that I thought I didn't like and so on. But usually that can be, you know, if not accounted for, you know, suggests some sort, somewhere there's an underlying continuity. It's not as though I'm absolutely subjectively constituted to like certain things and dislike certain things. They change. And yet I, I change as a person, and yet somehow I remain the same. So this is really the problem of personal identity. But it's really sharpened in aesthetic experience. You know, how, how am I the same person and yet different from myself at times to time? That just shows that sub subjective experience should never be thought of merely subjectivistically, you know? And again, no amount of subjective reflection, psychoanalysis of myself, or, you know, even professional psychoanalysis is going to account for all my aesthetic experiences, you know? It just it it doesn't produce this unity of self, which is a unity that, of course, is is vulnerable and open to um, fragmentation. So that might be a bit later on in the. Let me just go back a bit. Ah, yeah. Okay, so here we are. So outcomes of the critique. So what can we start to take away from all of this now? Um, well, one of the things I'm really suggesting is that analysis of aesthetic experience must place emphasis on the original meaning of the word. And by that, I mean the Greek word, aesthesos, which is to feel or to be touched by something. Hence, overly cognitive or mechanistic accounts of aesthetic experience are bound to fail. You know? And yet I, I think philosophers, and sometimes maybe elsewhere too, we still are you know, embedded within kind of causalistic accounts. Um, you know, certain properties create certain feelings or cause certain feelings in a subject. Uh, you know, if you think of the advertising industry, it's kind of makes, spends a lot of money trying to find out what those feelings are. But in a way, many advertisements that companies have spent a lot of money on fail. You know, and I think that's partially because they're too inclined towards a mechanistic account of aesthetic uh, experience. Um, and um, a second outcome is aesthetic experience is one that is vulnerable. You know, it exposes a fundamental affectivity in humans. So we're open to aesthetic experience. And by being open, we don't control it. You know, it happens to go back to that sort of passivity of the Heideggerian approach. Um, we have meaning and we have loss of meaning. And we can't put controls over that particularly when it comes to um, artistic production. You know, there's no guarantee ever of an aesthetic experience. Um, and yet we can be open to them, and that involves risk. You know, and it involves the risk of disappointments uh, and so on. And all of this has to, I think, be built into a, uh, a philosophy of art. Um, I think... Thirdly, one of the outcomes of the phenomenological critique of traditional philosophies of art is that aesthetic experiences, while not objective, are nonetheless co-constituted. They take always, they take place, I should have said, always and necessarily in community. So there's no such thing as just an individual aesthetic experience. An aesthetic experience, even one in which it you differ from the person next to you is nonetheless co-constituted by some sort of underlying um, communal orientation or being with others. You could never give an account of your aesthetic experience solely on the basis of yourself. 
it always involves a being uh, with others. And um, the uncontrollability of aesthetic experience is, is what makes some people call them dangerous. You know? So it's not easy to predict or control aesthetic experiences. Um, and at the same time, you know, because they're so deep, um, they're, they're meaningful um, and, and powerful. And so because they're uncontrollable, this makes people very nervous about aesthetic experience. Plato, the great philosopher at the origin of Western philosophy, was very nervous about the poets. And he's always complaining about the poets. The philosopher should be king, not the poets. Poets are dangerous because they make people feel things. And that can lead them away from this sort of cognitively based notion um, of truth. Um, so I just, you know, again, trying to throw in a picture. Remember there, aesthetics then has this, this, this sort of um, risk attached to it. And so one of the things that's very, very common in, you know, philosophy of art histories is to go back to um, the Berlin Olympics of 1936. So the Berlin Olympics in Nazi Germany set the aesthetic framework for all subsequent Olympics. You know, so what we consider very beautiful now and moving often originated at these games. Here's the one example, the torch relay. So, you know, the, the important moment where the person runs into the stadium with the torch, this has nothing to do with the ancient Olympics and was not part of the Olympic Games until 1936. This is solely an invention of a Nazi aesthetic. Yeah. But we still love it. Yeah. Everyone waits for the torch bearer. And this, again, shows something about you know, aesthetic experience that how, how deep it can be. And yet also it can be deep and contribute to pernicious social forms. Um, so this means we have to think about this vulnerability and this risk and this danger. And then I'll just run over this very quickly. I've taken longer than, than I expected. Um, uh, I, I wanted to say something about desire because desire is something that shows the same pattern of aesthetic. Uh, so it's kind of shifting focus, but it's not really getting away from a philosophy of art. Right? So desires show the same pattern of being neither objectively based or subjectively produced. So that's also very obvious. You know, everyone desires different things. You know, you can't say, oh, I desire that person. Someone next to you says, why? There's nothing desirable about that person at all or that idea, right? So desires can't be rooted in the objective characteristics of a person, right? Similarly, it's not merely subjective. It's not as though you just, you know, can desire anything you want. You can't talk yourself into desiring anything. Um, you know, you can't say, oh, I, I, I should desire that because my friend desires it. But you don't, you don't. And again, this can, this can lead to these, you know, hilarious situations in, you know, romances you know, which are our aesthetic experiences where you can't understand why your friend likes that particular person. Can't you see all their objective faults? Are you crazy? Why are you going out with that person? You know, they're always doing this to you and they're always doing that to you. The person's like, well, I don't know. I just, I kind of like being with this person. Huh? So philosophy of desire and thinking about how our desires get constructed is a kind of analogous way of thinking about aesthetic meaning. 
um, and aesthetic um, experience. And what I like about a kind of philosophy of desire attached to a philosophy of art is that it's less elitist. So everyone has desires. You know, I think art still, we have this tendency, you know, there are people who know more or less about it and and so on. I've tried to broaden the notion of aesthetic experience to make it less elitist, but it still clings to that. But when it comes to desires, you know, we know everyone has them. And it's very, very hard to argue my desires are better than your desires. You know, we don't have a museum of desires uh, that says this is real desire and that's you know, low class desire. Um, we may socially make those distinctions, but they're much harder to make, you know, or at least they're less ingrained than some of the distinctions we make within aesthetic um, experience. Um, desire also has this interesting transcendent quality. It comes from beyond, you know, again, you can't force yourself to desire something. It's kind of like you're, you're, you're under siege from something, you know, um, and, 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 and it calls forth the desire. Um, and so uh, this is something um, that's, that's important. And yet at the same time, it's deeply subjective. So you can get away from a subjectivistic subjectivity by thinking about desire. Because in a way, what happens in desire is you lose yourself. That's the whole thing. You're not subjectively in control anymore. I can't help myself. I love this person. I just can't help myself. That's, that's something that I think points to the way in which we experience, we have a lived experience of something that makes me who I am or is deeply entangled with who I am, and yet it comes from beyond me and I don't control it. It happens. Um, it happens. But of course, this also makes desire dangerous. And of course, and desires can be pathological. So you can, you know, go off the rails. So in psychoanalysis, um, you know, there are clear pathologies of desire. Uh, hysteria is a classic one. You know, so that's where you always postpone your object of desire right? So, because you actually like the feeling of desire. So in classic cases of pathology, uh, pa classic pathological cases of hysteria, you know, you'll always have an unattain unobtainable love object. You particularly, you learn, you, you somehow get attached to something you can never have. That's kind of exciting because then you can always have the desire you're afraid of the fulfillment of the desire because then you won't have desire anymore and you won't feel alive as a subject um so we we we, we create all sorts of you know strategies for preserving desire but that can become pathological where of course what you really desire is just the desire itself it has nothing to do with you know, another person or, or a particular um, uh, idea. And again, this is often classified as hysteria in um, psychoanalysis uh, of uh, uh, something. The vulnerability of desire can also lead us towards a, a, a desire of a lack of desire. We get tired of being thrown about by our desires. I don't want any more. I don't want any more. I want to shut down. So a kind of nervous breakdown um, is in some sense a way in which I, I cannot take any of this stimulus from beyond, which I don't control. I have to shut it off. And in various forms of schizophrenia, you know, this can take extremely pathological forms of trying to, um, you know, eliminate what you take to be the cause of uh, desire. So this shows that desire too is very dangerous. So what might this lead to at the end? And I think this is my concluding slide. Um, so, I mean, you could think about it, a, a healthy aesthetic culture or a culture of healthy desire. Um, I think there's a way in which we can think about how we cultivate aesthetic experience and our desires. Um, 
And we have to be very careful with the way we use that word. I, I'm using it in a very, uh, you know, a word, a way that's very close to the way we use it for gardening. You know, you can tend to your desires, but you can't create them. You can't make the flower bloom. But you can do the things that are necessary for the experience of the flower um, uh, to bloom. We can think about how desires are mimetic. So this is straight from Lacan. So we basically desire what other people desire. Um, so desire has what Lacan claims is a mim mimetic structure. Um, but of course, that doesn't mean that we don't subjectify that mimesis in a particular way. Um, and so how we think about education is really crucial for cultivating a healthy uh, culture of desire. Um, it can't be too prudish. Um, it, and it can't be too uh, boundless. <laughs> in the sense that you can have anything you want because desires are actually structured by a particular limitation. Uh, if you can have everything you want, you'll want nothing. We want things because they're limited. Uh, and so we have to think about that in terms of education too and educating us about these limits, these limits within which aesthetic experience um, and um, aesthetic experience take place. Um, so education must be about the cultivation of affectivity. You know, so not cognitive insight. Again, that's part of education. I'm a philosopher. I can't, I can't say, you know, let's just go watch movies. Um, but at the same time, I think we're, we're trying to think about a cultivation of affectivity, acceptance of vulnerability, and lack of control, and a recognition of difference. You know, so that there are different desires um, and different aesthetic experiences. And therefore that normal, if we're talking about healthy desires or, you know, positive aesthetic experiences versus national socialist aesthetic experiences, there, there is a broad spectrum and we can't judge beforehand where that spectrum becomes pathological. But there is a, a point where desire becomes pathological. And there is a point where art degenerates into uh, a propaganda of death, as it did in national socialism in Germany. Um, so this should all cause us, uh, you know, um, not to be frightened, but as I say, rather to act as an invitation to think communally about how we deal with our environment, uh, others, and ourselves in an aesthetic manner. And so the conclusion to my talk, not surprisingly, is that schools of art and design are at the core, not the periphery of cultivating a healthy society. So I'll end with that. Thanks very much. Certainly very reassuring, you know, for your <laughs> conclusion. <laughs> yes, we are in the School of Art and Design, yeah. So um, we have uh, some time, you know, for questions and comments, yeah. Critique, yeah. Yeah. Either objectively or subjectively. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah. <laughs> How? How? 
something like this critique fits into your understanding of your own education here. So again, you know, in a way I'm saying we have to think about this communally and one of the spaces for you to think about this communally is here and not just here in this room, but, you know, you know, and I'm sure you do among your friends, you know, um, this is a good chance to give suggestions for changes in the curriculum, uh, so on. Um, or does someone someone have maybe a phenomenological insight about their own experience that um, you should you shouldn't be shy. Ph phenomenology demands, you know, honesty and. Uh, and openness. So, any anything? Yeah. Hi, right, Professor. I have a question to ask. No better. Um, how things about um. Uh, objective or subjectives. Um, human being needs a medium to to explore, no matter objective or subjective. And the mediums we are using sometimes language. I'm not sure in uh, phenomenology studies how to see these medium language. And of course, there are different types of language, perhaps lang audio sense and we show and, and how these factors come into this your field of studies research. So um in a certain sense, language is central to this discussion because on the one hand, um language is not merely subjective. You know, otherwise it wouldn't function at all. So there has to be some sort of objective, um, you know, element one could say um, to it. But we never really understand the way language works. Maybe this is why it's such an an important question. I can see, you know, thinking about art and design within a linguistic framework is is so rich, because you know it's it's obviously not just tied to a kind of algorithmic or grammatical understanding of language. Um, so language is, it, it, it has a sort of social, sociability to it. It's only language if it somehow works. But at the same time, the way in which we tend to account for it working is, you know, tends to be um, so structured, kind of universalistic. And even if, even if, say, we speak different languages, you know, the, the whole idea now is that AI will just eventually get good enough that you don't have to learn English, you know, and I'll never have to learn Cantonese, you know, or Mandarin, uh, because, you know, AI will do it for me. And of course, the early AI, um, you know, experiments at translation were were very funny failures. Now, obviously, AI has a certain response mechanism built in where it is getting better at these kind of algorithmic translations. But of course, that tends that that tends to be you know fine for you know straightforward prose. You know, if you plug in T.S. Eliot, you know, and say, you know, translate this into Mandarin, um, you don't get T.S. Eliot. <laughs> you know? And you may get something that's actually quite funny. Now, again, you could say, oh, well, that that becomes, you know, that's just a lack of data and and feedback into the algorithmic processes of the uh, artificial translation mechanism. But in fact, I, I, I think the case is it will always miss. 
And why, why will it always miss? Because we miss an everyday discourse all the time among our native speakers. That's why we need dialogue. It's never one-to-one. -one. Sometimes it is with mere information. Open the door, please. Okay, that works more or less. But with important discussions with people, whether they're philosophical, academic discussions, um, professional discussions, we need, to, we need to talk it through, as we say, so that there's never an absolute overriding determination of language from the beginning. And so more concretely in response to your question, I think this is what makes what you're doing so interesting is that you're exploring something about this, this nature of language, which is neither just mine, but belongs to me and I'm responsible for what I say, you know, and is neither just an objective, you know, given that in a society that I'm brought up in and the closer I approximate this absolute, you know, sort of rule governed grammatical or algorithmic structure, the better citizen I am. No, speaking, speaking honestly, speaking publicly, um, you know, is something in between and underneath those types of accounts. And again, I, th I think that art and, um, um, you know, design have always, has, uh, has always, um, you know, been attentive to this. Uh, and, and, you know, if, if I had had more time, I, I, I originally, knowing that I was coming to, you know, a school where I'm so interested in, in what you do on the design side of things, um, I started paying attention to design recently. And one of the things uh, that came up was I just happened to be watching a show about design in Canada in the 1960s, which was really hot apparently. And I didn't know this, but I knew all these symbols or all these designs, but I, I didn't realize how ingenious they were. So, you know, there's the famous CN. I, I think this is probably a classic in teaching design. So Canadian National Railways. Um, so very important institution in Canada because it bound this big country together. Uh, and only because of um, you know, the railway is Canada able to function originally as this huge uh, entity. And Canadian National Railways always had this very traditional design, Canadian National Railways. So straightforward language with a maple leaf behind it, you know. And then in the 1960s, they were like, you know, it's really, it doesn't really convey, it doesn't really speak to what we want to be as a corporation. And so Fleming came up with this brilliant CN design. It's just one line, the C, and then it goes into the N, but it looks like a railway. Like it has a beginning and an end. And it's absolutely brilliant. And it's, it's stood the test of time as this absolutely, you know, brilliant development of language. <laughs> you know, the language of design, you know, in, in a certain sense. So I, again, I think um, language is central to these you know, discussions and, and not just poetry, you know, as, as Heidegger explains, but language very broadly um, uh, construed. So I, uh, I think you can, you can look at aesthetics from a philosophy of language standpoint um, as, um, as, as central. So thanks for emphasizing that. In art AI, because considering that, uh, well, you, we link art, like visual art, with language, because we have to give like a detailed um, description of what we want to see. Uh, and then the machine, the AI, gives us this 
image of what they well what what the robot thinks so what what is your right well again um you may have picked up on this a little bit i have i have my suspicions about the limits of ai um and and that they are are I, I think going to remain with us. I think there's this idea that as long as we got enough data, you know, and as long as we speak enough to them, as you say, and and reinforce certain things, we're going to get, you know, a, a good way in which language, spoken language, can somehow be translated conceptually into, you know, whatever the outcome um, is you want. I guess I, I guess I'm committed to this view that language is always going to miss. A little bit too so it doesn't always work and it will it doesn't work in everyday life there's no reason to believe it would work better algorithmically you know it's bound to miss more in a particular sense so i think i think one of the problems this is really an important is people have too mechanistic and um what one would say, um, um, a transmissional sense of language, you know, it just is, is an objective media and it's not, right? it's deeply subjective. That's why, that's why, you know, you can think of this in all sorts of different ways. Sometimes an example I use in phenomenology is this, your name, your name in language. Anyone could have my name. And many people do. Philip's not the most common name, but it's, 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 you know, I'm happy to have it. And it's associated with me deeply. And you know how children sometimes make fun of other children's names? Very cruel and very hurtful because the name is attached to me as a subject. And yet it's completely non-subjective. And it's, it's not even up to it. Just, you know, it's contingent. My parents decided to name me this rather than that. But it becomes you in a particular way. And I think this kind of way of thinking about language as that sort of naming and maybe a constant process of naming and renaming is a richer way to think about language than sort of algorithmic translation processes um, uh, somehow. And, you know, multimedia then becomes really interesting too as a way in which this more complex view of language gets more complex as as media crisscrosses um and and you get more and more elements so this doesn't simplify language this complicates language but i think language is very complicated uh and and deserves our attention um and again this is an important role for the artist to, to to, to broaden our conception of language and to deepen our understanding of the complexity of language. Right. We, we had this uh, painting on Adams and Eve. You want to say something on that, right? So that, that was... Uh... <laughs> I think this was my concluding slide, actually. Yes. With more the uh, so this is from uh, so I I just had the uh, like uh, Cranach. Uh, so I think these woodcuts, uh, you know, Durer and Cranach from you know kind of middle late Middle Ages in Germany are really fascinating. Uh, so this is a woodcut, and it's of the Garden of Eden. So, you know, this, this, you know, foundation myth in Western society of Adam and Eve and so on. And the reason I chose it was, um, so, you know, you can see the serpent. And, and so basically what, you know, I, I think you probably know the story is there was Adam and Eve and everything was really great in the garden, except God had said, there's one tree you should not eat from, and it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? And then the serpent, 
the devil comes and whispers to Eve, you should really try the fruit of that tree. So it's an interesting analysis of desire. That which is forbidden becomes desire, desirable. And Eve, of course, says to Adam, try the apple from that tree. So this is, you know, of course, now from a feminist standpoint, this is critiqued. You know, it's kind of the woman is always temptress. So again, um, um, desire comes in. You know, it's it's sort of so, you know, you can give a patriarchal reading of of this particular aspect of the Bible. It's like, don't trust women because they're always tempting you. But in fact, that's because they're always tempting. Um, so there's there's this reality of of desire again. So in a certain sense, desire creeps into the garden with knowledge. And from there, everything, you can say everything goes wrong, but I think a more appropriate way to say is that's when humanity begins, you know? So it's, it's with this vulnerability, this threat of desire, um, the threat of then trying to control our desires through purely cognitive processes. Um, uh, and it doesn't mean that there isn't good and evil, but they're not, they're not cognitive. They're much more effective. So this even, you know, this, this talk could be reframed as a ethical talk. You know, this aesthetic experience is very close to moral experience. You know, morality too is not completely subjective or completely objective or some, it has to be reconsidered as a kind of sensitivity. Uh, and it doesn't mean there aren't such things as morals. And it doesn't mean there's, there is no such thing as evil. You know, it's just not objective. And it's not purely subjective either. Um, so again, you can see how the phenomenological tradition can uh, cu um, cut across uh, all these strands. Um, but um, yeah, and so the Garden of Eden has always been Eve's temptation of Adam has always been, you know, a great theme of art um, in the in the West. Uh, it's the, it's the beginning of. Um, um, desire, and maybe it's the beginning of art, uh, too. It's the beginning, also the end. So <laughs> thank you, Phil, for your great uh, lecture today. And um, um, but those of you who are interested to know more about phenomenology, on Friday, um, there would be a discussion on phenomenology of music, right? And I always wonder, actually, you know, Merleau Ponty wrote this phenomenology of perception. Why wouldn't there be a phenomenology of sound or audition, right? <laughs> this is the problem. This is the problem. Philosophers can never end. Uh, and and so on, but this is a very interesting question, actually. Um, so my colleague uh, from CUHK, Saulius, is giving a paper on the phenomenology of music, and um, but it is true that this perceptual side of things dominates in philosophical discourse, and um, not the auditory. Um, and so this has been, um, um, an, an issue, but it's, it's, it's been worked on. So, and a lot of this goes back to the Greeks. So in Plato, in Aristotle, most of the discussion is visual. You see the forms, you see the ideas. And that's why this phenomenological, um, sort of rehabilitation of affectivity. It's not what we see, it's what we feel. And that's much closer to a kind of auditory 
uh, notion um, than a kind of perceptual. You know, perception literally means going out and grabbing the world and, and putting it in order. And I think this notion of uh, hearing and music, um, um, you know, is really important. Merleau-Ponty may still be part of this tradition in a way, but Husserl and Heidegger, Heidegger less so, but Husserl actually uses music quite a bit to account for temporality. And uh, so the way time works um, is actually better thought as a kind of auditory flow than a visual. Um, flow but a really important question thank you well we might uh, continue that on friday then yeah so thank you very much for your attendance yeah